Hey all. Great to be back on the stage. In 2019, I, uh, I did like 30 countries and the pandemic hit, so thank you for sticking around. I'm going to try and blow your mind, right? Um, Michael calls me a futurist. You know what a definition of a futurist is? Never being wrong today. Yeah? So, um, but bear that in mind. Now, when we talk about crypto and what's going to be happening in the crypto markets and tokens and centralization and decentralization and all of these elements, Often our view of the world is fairly short term. I'm going to take you 30 years out and things get pretty funky, you know, in terms of the way the world's going to work. There's going to be some seismic changes to the way we think about economic activity, the way we think about economics, assets, money. And so I want to get into that today. And that's really going to take you, I think, hopefully to the next level of where we go. So let's talk about the world of 2050. First of all, we're going to have, you know, every major economy in the world is going to be, have at its foundation artificial intelligence and a bunch of technology. Whether that's supply chain automation, whether that's improvements in healthcare and longevity, artificial general intelligence, maybe super intelligent AIs, maybe we'll have. Uh, you know, Elon Musk's uh, Neuralink uh, to augment our own intelligence. These are some of the proposals we have. Often, uh, obviously, we're going to have the space industry is going to increase, uh, as well as just generally um, Web3, Metaverse, and, you know, immersive technologies in the world around us. But no economy in the world will be a leading global economy without high levels of automation. You won't be able to compete. Why? because it's the automation of economies that will make them successful in the world of the 2050s. Um, so you won't be able to compete on the basis of resources. You won't be able to compete on the basis of human capital. It'll all be down to your de deployment of technology in that uh, economic ecosystem, which is one of the reasons that China will soon be the world's number one economy. Because at an infrastructure level, China is now ahead of the United States. You know, we just debated this big infra infrastructure bill in the US most recently, but China's already invested around $8 trillion in Belt and Road. They started their CBDC program in 2014. For every one PhD graduate in the STEM arena that graduates in the United States, China produces five. They have regulation on artificial intelligence. They have better neuromorphic chips than we do here in the US right now. They are an economy that is well positioned to transition into a smart economy of the 21st century. The US, we have to get over these legacy policies and markets and capital markets and thinking that we have. One of the key areas that um, China's made big advancements on is the way you pay and the way you use money in the economy. This is going to be a consistent feature of economies in 2050. Today, mobile wallets outnumber plastic card payments by more than two to one. You probably, you know, most people don't even realize that, but plastic cards are old tech. Mobile wallets are the way we will transact in the future. In 2020, China did $52 trillion of mobile payments. They're not the only mobile wallet plays out there. We, you know, yes, we have Alipay and Tencent, WeChat Pay, but we have Mpesa, Kakao, Gcash, Paymaya, Paytm, all of these mobile wallet schemes. And in the economy of 2050, your mobile wallet will be how you transact in the metaverse, how you transact in the real world, how you transact with crypto or CBDC or how smart contracts are built. More machines will have wallets than humans in 2050. But certainly plastic cards and cash won't be very useful in the economy of 2050, if they exist at all. So this is a, um, a clip from Ready Player One, and you know, this is an illustration of how wallets will act as a bridge between crypto and digital currencies and um, you know, the physical and, and virtual worlds. Imagine going to a store in the, in the metaverse, buying goods and having them shipped to your home. You're not going to swipe a credit card in the metaverse. That's crazy, right? So this is how we bring together operations of stable coins, CBDCs. Wallet aggregation will be a big feature of 2050. And the rails that we think about today, like Swift and MasterCard and Visa, they simply won't be useful in this world of 2050 because it will all be highly automated in real time. 
So one of the things that China may do to accelerate de-dollarization is, for example, tie the ECMY central bank digital currency to their Belt and Road Trade Initiative. Now remember, China is already, you know, the biggest trading company in the world in terms of uh, production. But in this future world, if the Belt and Road and this infrastructure, smart supply chain automated infrastructure that China has been creating, if this uh, is going to be fully automated, we're going to have to have digital currencies because smart contracts don't work with fiat, right? So we're either going to have to have CBDCs or stable coins or something like it. China could effectively use the Belt and Road. If you want to trade on Belt and Road, you have to use a CBDC wallet. That's not impossible. It's not China's intention right now, but the central bank in China has been clear that technically they could do this. So they're obviously thinking about it. But the biggest economies in the world are going to be smart. And that intelligence comes with changes in the way we think about core infrastructure. Fusion reactors, thorium reactors, wind, solar renewables are all elements that's going to create a very cheap operating environment for energy systems. But that has massive effects on the capital markets today, which rely very heavily on the trade in uh, fossil fuel commodities. So free energy is something that the current system doesn't want. But it's largely inevitable because you can't have smart economies operating with uh, great resource allocation unless you fix the long-term energy problems. So how are we going to fix it? Well, you know, fusion reactors are still some time away, but we do have renewables which could power 80% of the planet even by the early 2030s. What we'd need to address for that is we would need to fix storage. We would need to enable store, large energy storage at a grid level. We do have battery level or grid level battery storage farms emerging in places. Um, Australia, most notably Tesla, deployed a battery farm there, which is now 300 gigawatts. Um, and you know, for most economies, they're only going to need about eight hours of storage generally. Um, for you know, their, most of their grids to be able to operate. But the grids aren't going to operate like we think about energy production today. We are going to have to decentralize energy because the most efficient forms of energy generation in the future world are going to be distributed grids, not centralized generation like we have today. So interestingly, there are major industries that are going to really benefit from decentralization at a nation state scale. In fact, energy production may have combinations of centralized generation with big solar farms and then rooftop solar, rooftop wind and other elements like this, batteries stored at a local uh, community level, as an example. But it's going to be very different. But there are other industries that will need more centralization than we see today. Um, and we've seen this during the pandemic with healthcare. Is you know we had all of these great pandemic plans. The U.S. had developed for 40 years pandemic response plans, and they sort of all went out the window. But in highly automated societies where healthcare is automated, then data is the key to efficient resource allocation and efficient costs at that uh, level for healthcare. For a national healthcare system in the United States based on artificial intelligence based on gene therapy, based on things like 3D bioprinting, maybe the use of some cybernetics, AI diagnostics, we could provide the entire US with free healthcare, universal healthcare, at 30% of the costs of the current system. The decentralized system that the US has today is not very efficient. The US pays twice for healthcare what other OECD nations pay, and our healthcare outcomes in the US are often worse. Remember this, 40% of diagnostics in the United States are wrong. 40% of the time, a doctor gives you a diagnosis on your symptoms, they're wrong. That's why you always ask for a second opinion, right? But in this world of 2050, healthcare will not about be going to the doctor and getting a diagnosis for your symptoms because your personal health cloud will know when you're sick before you do based on gene therapy, real-time uh, bio data, and so forth. So healthcare in 2050 will be a subscription service. Most of that will be provided for free. But if you want longevity, if you want to live to the ripe old age of 150 or 200, 
then you're going to have to pay for the privilege for that, obviously. But the only way healthcare is going to work on that basis is large-scale centralization to get the data efficiencies and efficiencies of scale. So some things we think should be centralized will become decentralized and vice versa. But at the heart of smart economies is autonomous supply chains, smart contracts running the world with a lot of autonomous vehicles, drones, self-driving trucks, uh, you know, machines that make machines, you know, gigafactories and so forth. These are at the heart of smart economies. Now, when you have that level of automation, guess what? You need to automate it all. The legal side, the regulatory side, the monetary side, it's all black box function of the economy, essentially. You must have smart contracts or you won't compete. You must have electronic or digital money tied to those smart contracts. Whether it's a CBDC or a crypto or a token or you know, a stable coin, that's going to be largely immaterial because the black box will basically figure that out. But every leading economy in the world will be based on this type of core intelligent design. Why? Because it comes down to efficient resource allocation. If you're going to have profitable economies, you have to be able to make use of those resources in the most efficient way possible, and AI is going to be the course of that. Now, robots will outnumber humans by 2050. We'll have more robots on the planet than humans. And they'll be delivering food, they'll be driving us around. My only advice is to you, uh, just be kind to robots. You never know what's going to happen in the future, right? Um, this is a, a, a film off Netflix called Mute, and it shows uh, food being delivered by a drone that comes into your home, drops it off on the table, and disappears out the window. You might have seen pizzas delivered in Ready Player One using drones and so forth. This is just part of the sort of society-level automation we're like to, likely to see in these smart economies of the future. So where does this take us in terms of the way we think about economics? Well, this is the classic supply and demand curve Adam Smith created in 1776 with the Wealth of Nations. The idea being that as demand for a product or service uh, increases, to satisfy that demand, we have to put more human capital into the system to create the supply of goods and services to get to equilibrium. But this assumes that human capital is an important part of the economy. The economy of 2050 doesn't have human capital at the core production element of society. We have processing cycles, we have chips, we have AI, we have autonomy, and so the core economic engine of a lot of the economy that we have in 2015 will be completely automated, which means humans working nine to five to put food on the table, that won't work in the 2050s. Your value as an economic unit in the economy, as you, in terms of your economic output as an employee or a factor of human capital, won't be a factor in the operation of a smart economy. So what are you going to do for work instead? Well, that's really up to you. But at a society level, we're likely to have to have things like universal basic income. Either that or we're going to have revolution, because as unemployment skyrockets as a result of automation and those people are displaced, you have a lot of unhappy people. So this is why you hear Elon Musk, Bill Gates, Richard Branson, Mark Zuckerberg, all of these guys talk about UBI. Because the capital markets reward companies getting smarter and automating and eliminating humans from the workforce. So if you don't want to go, you don't want, as a technologist, if you don't want the, uh, the mass populace coming for you with pitchforks, we're going to need UBI. It's a, a logical outcome. People say, but you need work. You know, people need work to have purpose in their life. Sure, well, you can do whatever you want now. You know, when we look at U the 75 UBI trials around the world, we see that um, UBI trials produce people that start their own businesses at three or four hundred percent higher rates than in the natural population. Because once you don't have to worry about putting food on the table, you can do whatever you're passionate about. It doesn't mean we won't work. It just means we won't have to work to live in this world of the future.
So this changes economics. But the world of 2050 is going to have some difficulties. Food scarcity is already starting to be a problem post-pandemic with the supply chain issues we've had. Um, but climate change is going to accentuate this. We've lost 40% of our arable land over just the last 50 years due to soil erosion, uh, pollution, warming temperatures and so forth. If we take just the example of, say, wine, you know, as a, as a commodity, the Bordeaux region in France is expected to see 90% crop failures by the early 2030s because of warming temperatures. But Britain will become a wine-producing country. Now, that sounds great. We're still going to have wine. Britain will be able to produce wine. But what happens to all those people that were working in the wine industry in France? They're displaced. But crop failures are a big problem for us because the combination of crop failures and, of course, sea level rise is going to create massive problem with eco-refugees. The estimates are broad here. Between 300 million and 1.6 billion eco-refugees displaced because of either sea level rise or food scarcity by 2050. Now, even if you take the lower estimate of this, we've never seen a disaster of this sort of humanitarian scale. And certainly the question of, well, who's going to pay for it? That becomes meaningless in the scale of an, a... Uh, human disaster like this. We're going to have to figure out on a global basis either how we save all of these lives or are we going to say, you know, the economy takes priority over human lives. That's not really a reasonable position. This is a core philosophical shift that humanity is going to have to deal with. But highly automated societies allow us to deal with this in a very different way from the way we think about it today either socialism versus capitalism and so forth. Those terms become largely meaningless in this world of the future. We are going to have to become more self-sufficient. Supply chain automation will lead to us doing things like vertical farming within cities, lab-grown proteins. Uh, you know, you won't get your meat from a cow. It'll be a, a token cow or a digital cow or a lab cow, you know, I don't know. But, um, we're going to need this to keep feeding everybody in, in the 21st century. Uh, and you might eventually have printers, uh, 3D printers at home that print you off a burger and stuff like that. We're not quite at the replicator stage by 2050. But self-sufficiency is part of the supply chain automation solutions in highly efficient economies. Homelessness won't exist in the 2050s. We will use things like 3D printed technology to be able to provide ubiquitous, very cheap housing for people and uh, make that available. Yes, there will still be some elements of commercial real estate, and if you want something above the sort of cookie-cutter 3D printed models, you may have to pay. But again, um, you know, this comes back to what is the core economy for in the 2050s? Today, we might say, well, the purpose of the economy is economic growth, GDP growth, you know, full employment. But already, the, you know, in a highly automated world, those concepts become challenged. So at the heart of smart economies of the 21st century is making sure all of the citizens' basic needs are covered first and foremost as a priority of the economy. That is the point of automation, just as the point of artificial intelligence is to eliminate humans from the workforce. Big philosophical changes. You'll get your food for free. You'll get your housing for free. You'll get energy for free. This really does change the way we think about commerce and the economy. But science fiction's been talking about the future for a long time, but crypto is generally conspicuously absent from this world of the future in terms of science fiction. So let's talk about what science fiction got right and what it often gets wrong in terms of now where we understand the trajectory of the 21st century. This is a great quote from William Gibson's book, uh, Count Zero, where he talks about the protagonist not being able to use cash. Not because it was illegal, but nobody ever did anything legitimate with it. This is a fairly accurate assessment of physical cash in the world of 2050s. Physical cash will be fairly useless and will mostly have disappeared by uh, that stage. You can't buy stuff in the metaverse with physical cash. You can't have robots using physical cash. You need to have uh, digital currency. 
So, of course, we heard from uh, Neil Stevenson as well. And um, he was really the first, he was the first to coin the phrase metaverse and snow crash, and of course with CryptoMonicon. He, he was the closest we've got to in terms of science fiction describing the type of cryptocurrency worlds that we'll have in the future. But even when you see ga games like cyberpunk and so forth, this concept of a central global currency keeps coming up. You know, euro dollars in the case of cyberpunk. And, and um, the reality is, we're probably never going to have a centralized global currency unless it's on Mars, right? But on the Earth, we're probably going to have more and more fragmented currencies. But your wallet will work all that out. Your wallet will be smart enough to let you pay in crypto or stable or CBDC or some legacy fiat you might have in a bank balance if it still exists. But science fiction gets this wrong. It also gets banking wrong. This is from Total Recall in 2012. This guy, you know, the, um, Colin Farrell's playing this character. He walks into a bank and he gives an account number to access his safety deposit box. Is this the same future we're talking about? Account numbers? That's crazy, right? Um, he's also asked to sign at one point, which I didn't show, and use biometrics at the same time. Why do you need a signature when you've got biometrics, right? He goes in, gets his safety deposit box, and he opens up his, uh, you know, his, his package there, and he's getting access to his, his personas things. So here he pulls out his passports. Seriously, we're going to have physical passports in 2050? Right, that's crazy. Um, you know, because your face, your, your biometrics, your behavior will be your identity in the future, and AI will integrate that into society. And we're using cash in 2050? United Federation of Britain with Barack Obama's face on it? I don't know how that works, but physical cash? No. So science fiction often gets this stuff wrong. But there is an element of science fiction that is going to be mind-blowing in terms of its economic impact, and that is the future of you know, expanding humanity into the solar system. Asteroid mining is just one aspect of that, as is colonization on Mars. I don't know whether you've heard of this, but in September of this year, NASA is sending this probe called Psych six, uh, to an asteroid called Psyche 16. It's called the Psyche mission. It's launching in September on a Falcon Heavy rocket, and it's going out to uh, map this asteroid that's out in the asteroid belt. Now, this is a fairly typical asteroid, but what makes it of interest to NASA and the rest of the world is that it is masses amount of um, rare earth metals, and raw materials that we could use, uh, lots of gold, silver, um, you know, and these precious metals that we could use. So we have uh, Google's Moonshot program and others looking at how we might do asteroid mining in the future. Now, if you think this is not feasible, just think about it in a different way. The most challenging part of doing asteroid mining or um, colonizing the solar system today is Earth's gravity well, getting outside of Earth's gravity. It's a very difficult task. But once we establish a base on the moon, the cost of getting out to the asteroid belt and Mars becomes fractional compared with what it is today. So this is the major thing that's going to help us move forward. What is the impact of an asteroid like Psyche 16? It is worth 10 quintillion dollars in today's terms. That's 100,000 times current global GDP. One asteroid. So we've got free energy, we've got no human labor in society, and now we have abundant low-cost resources. Commodities market is exploded. Capital markets are fractured. The economics of 2050 completely blow away the structures that we have in terms of wealth and assets and resources and those things in this world of the future. It's great for humanity in terms of this post-scarcity world, but obviously we're going to have some pain making this transition because of the vested interests that exist today. One thing we know is that there is the intent to colonize Mars. So here's the question. How would you design a cryptocurrency or a CBDC for Mars? What would it be like? 
Well, Elon really hasn't described his thoughts about this, but there was a fantastic series on the colonization of Mars written by a science fiction author called Kim Stanley Robinson. I don't know if you've heard of him. He wrote a trilogy called Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars, obviously talking about the terraforming of Mars. And on that, he proposed a completely different economic system, one he coined as eco-poetics. And he's done uh, you know, uh, academic papers on this as well. And the theory was that in these early stages of the Mars colony, the primary overriding objective, and Elon has uh, emphasized this, is becoming self-sufficient. What happens if the starships stop coming from Earth? You have to get the colony self-sufficient as quickly as possible. So this creates an economy where you're rewarded for putting more into the system than you are taking out of it. So imagine a cryptocurrency where the value of your tokens or your currency grows based on the amount of air, water and food that you create, not based on what you sell or how much work you do. This sort of sustainable prosperity that would be necessary for the success of a Mars colony would produce a system that works very differently from today's capitalist system. And capitalism really doesn't have any benefit to the early Mars colony. You're not going to be shipping resources back to Earth. Every resource you can get and extract on Mars, you'll use for the sustainability of the colony. So you'll have two very different systems emerge from a human economic management perspective. One offshore, and, uh, you know, outer planet, and one uh, on the Earth. So this leads us to the inevitable conflict between today's capitalist economic system and this world of the future. I call it the digital asset wars, but you could call it the uh, you know, fourth industrial revolution, you know, and, and so forth. But it's really that old world view of capital and resources versus what we see emerging based on this future. One thing we do know today is that 51% of all commodities trade are energy-based. So when you have free energy produced by these new technologies and we transition off of fossil fuels, how is this going to affect the commodities market? It's a fundamental restructuring there. And, you know, we can talk about climate change and all of that, but let's think about the fact that fossil fuels are a great illustration of why capitalism isn't efficient for humanity as a species in its current form at least. Because we've known since the 70s that air quality is a major problem for human health. Seven to 10 million people die every year as a result of fossil fuel air pollution. Now we could have accelerated the adoption of cleaner energies, but the market was making a ton of profit out of fossil fuel. This is where things like climate change and automation in society is gonna to have to readjust this balance not focused purely on profitability, but focused on more equitable systems for all. So this physical and digital world has this sort of yin and yang that's going to create this tension between the old worldview of assets and this new worldview of assets, whether it's digital assets, smart contracts, and high levels of automation. Ownership is less important in the world of the future than it was in the past. So we've got various mechanisms we're using to digitize the world. This is early stages yet, but you know, it starts with smart contracts, and then we have NFTs, pass-through securities, we have utility-based tokens, we have digital IP, we have digital twins such as you know, our uh, medical records and so forth, our digital identity. All of this is part of our effort to move the world towards a completely digitized uh, record of human society, the way it operates. Um, but already we see the tension. We see the shots fired by the old system trying to slow down this transition to the new system. Whether or not you believe uh, you know, the Terra Luna crash was uh, just part of the, the normal cycle or whether it was uh, you know, sped up by BlackRock and others, right? Here's the thing. In highly automated societies, most of the economy is run by machines. AIs. There's not human intermediaries making profit off this system unless they own that technology. And that, you know, increasingly it becomes more centrally owned, just part of the core economic function. But by the 2050s, more than half of the economy will be black box machine to machine. How will a self-driving car pay for electricity? It's not going to get a bank account. 
It's not going to go down the branch. It may trade its driving time for access to electricity or paying road tolls. This sort of arbitrage and bartering and so forth, it may be such that the AIs are doing this AI to AI and we don't even know what they're doing, but it, it works because it's a black box. It's a very different way of thinking about the system. We talk about the blockchain, that's great for creating a broad decentralized access to data, but do you really want everyone to have access to your children's DNA on the blockchain? This is something we're going to have to lay over the top of these systems to ensure that there, there must be some regulation that takes place. Now we're talking about virtual real estate. There's a theory out there today that, you know, putting people in the metaverse and giving them headsets and giving them a virtual home is a strategy to distract them from the massive inequality that's going to be existing in the real world based on the current system. Already the United States has more inequality today than the world had in the Middle Ages. So it's a massive problem and it increased in terms of that problem in the, uh, um, uh, during the pandemic, obviously. But it's not just virtual real estate we have to worry about. Right? There's a whole lot of physical real estate that will become worthless as a result of sea level rise. Over 40% over of the world's population lives within uh, 100 kilometers or 50 miles approximately of the, uh, the coast, coast of the Earth. And the second thing you should know is that um, uh, humans don't breathe underwater. So that means we're going to have to come up with a strategy of this. New York and Miami are going to be the largest U.S. cities impacted by this, but Calcutta, Guangzhou, Shanghai, um, you know, Bangladesh, 80% of their infrastructure will be destroyed by sea level rise. The Maldives won't exist in um, 2100. How are we going to deal with that? Well, the biggest employer of the 2050s, ironically, is probably going to be a global force supported by the world's nations and economics mitigating the effects of climate change. Sea wall defences around New York, um, dealing with displaced populations, dealing with access to food supply and so forth. This is going to be the biggest employer of the 21st century, but not in the way we think about employment today. Maybe you'll have to do a couple of years of climate mitigation national service to qualify for universal basic income. Maybe the UBI is a CBDC. We'll see how that develops. So carbon capture, carbon sequestration, um, you know, new energy grids, this adaptation will be largely com complete by 2050 in terms of energy, but it will still be a massive force up until the 2100s in terms of human effort to fix the problems we've created around climate. So this requires a high level of global coordination. So when we talk about centralized and decentralization, this doesn't mean global government, but it does mean global coordination. There's no such thing as a national climate change policy in this world. We must have global coordinated action. And climate change is also going to produce dozens more pandemics like we've had with COVID as a result of releasing primordial viruses into the wild. So let's wrap it up. There are four potential possibilities for humanity as, as a human system moving forward. The worst outcomes are when we leave it and we don't plan for the future and we just let it happen. So that's either we reject technology because automation is getting rid of human labor, or we just leave it too late to respond to things like climate change. That's the latter stand and fail to stand, fail to stand scenario but we really have two competing economic views of the world moving forward. A view of the collective good and using technology to improve the lives of everybody, or the current system where we double down on it. And that is neo-feudalism versus a sort of collective technology utopia, if you like. And it's not clear which of those two worlds, the techno-socialist world or neo-feudalist world, we're gonna emerge into. The US is tracking for neo-feudalism. China is tracking for techno-socialism. Which one will win? We'll see. So here's the question I want to ask you. What are you going to do with crypto? What are you going to do in this industry? Is your purpose to make a ton of money out of it? Or do we have a bigger purpose? Can we use crypto 
and blockchain and smart contracts and tokens to change the world, to eliminate inequality, to create broad prosperity. Because right now, we're still probably looking at crypto being a cause of further inequality because it works in the current system. Uh, the secret to this, again, is automation. Governments, to compete, are going to have to be autonomous. So they're going to have to be DAOs. And when you do that, you have to eliminate the type of representative government that we have today. You have to make it real time. You eliminate regulation because that now is just code built into AI for the purpose of more efficient economic operation and resource allocation. But we do have to fix the way we decide on policy. Is that consensus-based, or do we have individuals run that? So here's the question I want to leave you with. We could use crypto and digital, uh, the digital asset evolution to create an entirely new optimal humanity where we use this to create a sustainable and prosperous world for all humans rather than just a select group. But we have to be purposeful about that. And that is going to explode the current system of economic thinking and politics. That's the choice I want you guys to think about. Is this a world of sustainable prosperity based on the digitization of money, contracts, and economics? Or are we going to double down on neo-feudalist capitalism 2.0? which is going to benefit a few people, and the rest are going to have to survive on UBI. That's the choice that we have in 2050. Thanks very much for attending this closing session today. This is my new book, Rise of Techno-Socialism. And uh, we'll ask Ben to come out and see if we can tackle a couple of questions. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, it's very mind-bending, uh, very interesting. So I just wanted to ask you about central banks. Uh, do you think they'll still exist in 2050? Um, and what, what, will, what will be their role, do you think, in the future? Who thinks central banks will still exist in 2015? Uh, 2050. 2050. 2050. Uh, so here's the thing is, Ben, um, you know, when we look at automated economies like this, we're essentially taking the regulatory and supervisory function, putting it in code. So all of the function we have, examiners and um, you know, uh, the, the suspicious transaction reporting and all of that, that goes away. AML reporting becomes a you know, cyber security type network function, which requires um, either regional um, a coordination at a coding level and a data level, but it doesn't require a regulatory body in the way we think about it today. But you will have a regulatory function that's policy setting, which um, goes into code. So central banks, as they exist today, will be eliminated by a network of um, you know, uh, uh, systems that, that flow money and um, a code base that regulates that in terms of financial crime and so forth. Right. Uh, so you're making a prediction about greater centralization, uh, and this is a festival of decentralization, which is a pretty ballsy thing to do. So talk about that a bit. Yeah, I guess there's that too, right? Um, so uh, here, here's, the, here's the interesting point, though, is within this, it allows for lots of different flavors. So you could have a lot of different ecosystems, including small ecosystems that are decentralized, but when you want to cooperate with the larger cross-border stuff, um, or when it comes to financial crime and the way identity is handled, there are obviously needs to be some constraints to that from an um, identity and a system perspective in these highly automated systems. It's not necessarily that you're going to wear a QR code on your forehead to be identified in the system, right? Um, but it, it is going to be the fact that to be a citizen of the 21st century, you have to be primarily a digital uh, citizen. Okay. How do you think money will work in the future? Do you think we'll have uh, money issued by nation states, or will it be something more like Bitcoin, do you think? So I, there, there is obviously potential for some value exchange mechanisms to become more popular than others based on their utility with this machine-led world. But the thing is, when you get down to the machine level, um, you know, a, a solar grid that generates energy might be creating a solar token, you know, and that's the way its utility is measured. A self-driving car may be measured on the way it uses electricity and the way it, uh, you know, how many hours it's on the road. So smart contracts are going to tokenize that activity because that's how smart contracts will be valued. 
So that it's more likely that we'll fragment currency more than we have today. Um, and so there is definitely an opportunity to create value around those different systems. So more types of money in the future? Absolutely. Okay. Thanks very much. No worries. Thank you all.